Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. If you haven't already done so, please go to patreon.com slash indoctrination to become a supporter of the show. And you'll find it right there. And you can support it for any amount you're able to. It's something that's really vital to keep the show on the air, which I want to be able to do for as long as possible for all those who are listening and get benefit from having this be something that is a resource to them and to their loved ones each week. So thank you very much for your support. And today on the show, we have Daniel. And Daniel is an entrepreneur and was raised inside the church. His journey into understanding the nature of fraud and its application to religion started when he was excommunicated from his church for exposing sexual abuse. This has led him to ask the hard questions around his most deeply held beliefs. He has found healing through conversations around faith and abuse. He shares very personal stories with the hope that it will help others to find strength and healing. Here's Daniel now. Welcome, Daniel Ice, to the podcast. I know that we're going to have a lot to talk about, so I have a feeling this will be part one of a two-parter, and I want you to be able to introduce yourself, but first, let me just say to people that I think one of the things that I like about this podcast and the people who come on is that they have different ways of looking at indoctrination in different environments and -hmm. through different means. And so this is one of those talks. And so that's why I'm very excited about this angle. And I think it's something that affects a lot of people and people might not actually realize that it happens as often as it does or how to notice when it's happening. So take it away, Daniel, introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about what you want to talk about. Yeah. So my name is Daniel. I grew up in a evangelical slash fundamentalist, you know, kind of upbringing. My dad is a pastor. Both my brothers, you know, serve in the ministry as well. And, you know, I, I no longer, you know, go to church. A few years ago, uh, I was excommunicated for exposing uh, some sexual abuse happening uh, inside of my local church. And uh, it was easier to get rid of me than to deal with the problem. I, I've been in multiple churches where, you know, happenstance, I've, I've exposed, uh, you know, sexual abuse and, you know, sexual malfeasance uh, among, you know, leaders or other members. Just happenstance happened that way. And a lot of people think that my story is unique. I don't really see it as being that unique, especially, you know, as I've talked to more people through the community and, and find out that uh, sexual malfeasance is rampant. What I bring to the conversation, I think, is my my background as an entrepreneur. And so I'm always looking for ways to make new business models. And uh, I'm also kind of an abstract thinker. And so I take a very like meta approach to the world and uh, meta being above. And uh, what I've really started to identify is what I'd call the business model of fraud. It's really what is driving a lot of the uh, uh, the religious movements and, uh, you know, really is is a powerful set of principles that these religious leaders use to establish a psychological authority and, and really create a sustainable business around these things. And businesses can happen in all sizes and scales. So everybody tends to think about business as being this very large thing, but it could be, it could be a very, like a micro business. It could be just you know, five, 10 families that all get together and pull their resources in such a way that they they create the economics for these, you know, often toxic environments to continue. And uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of the the general topic and 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 concept that that I'm working on developing. And and um, yeah, I, I I hope it's helpful for people to analyze kind of what what they've been through or or just look at the situations they're in and ask if they're if they're healthy and they want to stay there. Right. I think when we talk about fraud, a lot of people 
will be thinking about it uh, in financial terms. But I think it really is, um, like you're saying, it's a certain style of interacting with people. And I think also a certain kind of abandon of conscience, because if you're fine with it, then what does that mean? What does that mean about you? And also, sometimes it might not mean something about you systemically uh, or in terms of your wiring, but what is it about the environment you're in that's promoting that or justifying it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's a very interesting thing to look at, too, because a lot of people leave these sorts of environments and they haven't learned anything only because that's sort of who they were. They were looking for an opportunity to lie to people, to be fraudulent, to get away with things. And other people leave really feeling quite guilty that they were able to be kind of stirred up into behaving a certain way and thinking that it was okay at the time for them to take power away from someone else, to take the ability for someone else to make a fully educated decision before buying into something. And that uh, I think also the environment that sometimes will pump people up, you know, the, the salesman who will talk about having uh, that kind of feeling conjured up in them and then, you know, everyone sort of jumping and high-fiving and before COVID. The COVID thing is really interesting. So there's a large church here um, in the LA area and their leader uses a very strong marketing tactic that I call divide and conquer. There probably is a better term for it, but he's been on a very long-term kick where going back to the 70s when the charismatic movement came on the scene, he declared them to be bad. And so the charismatic movement, for those who aren't necessarily uh, up to date, believes that God has spiritual gifts and spiritual experiences happening now in the present, and it's not just back in the New Testament times. And there's a lot of theological reasons and ways that people get there, but this guy made a career out of that. And then his next divide and conquer tactic. And so what happens is people that are against this thing are attracted to that. And they, they may be against it because they have theological qualms, they've had interpersonal conflicts, whatever, or they, they've studied the Bible themselves and they have hold this viewpoint. So they go to somebody that has a strong teaching on that. There are types of experiences that are marketed to everybody. Some products are designed to be easy to consume and quick and fast. Other products are designed to attract people that think. It may be a little sacrilege to talk about everything in terms of marketing, but you have a value prop, right? We are the expositors of truth. That's the value prop, right? The human brain loves to resolve with finality concepts. And so when you say this is right and this is wrong, people can make a decision about your product. One of the harder parts in entrepreneurship is early on when you don't actually know what your product is. And so you're out there trying to tell people and until you get it into clear terms, you may have had the product built all along, but if you can't express that product to people, they don't know what it is. So you start, you you pick an enemy, you pick a, like, we're, we're against high transaction fees, right? That's one of the things that my, my company is working on. We're trying to solve the problem of stealing, of stopping credit cards from being stolen. And if you can do that, you can lower transaction fees. And so we, we make an enemy out of the hacker. And, and so enemies aren't inherently bad or good. They're just, they're a modality of talking, their way of expressing and so this theological leader, after the charismatic issue, then picked Calvinism versus the free grace movement. So Calvinism is, of course, the view that everything's predestined. And there, there's varying degrees of what's predestined and all this kind of stuff. And free grace says God gives grace freely. And this was called the lordship salvation debate. Are you really saved if you don't make Christ Lord and Savior of your life? And if you don't have fruit, meaning you don't do the things that we say you should do, you must not really be a Christian. One of the second tactics is using these black and white rules to then cause people to commit more into the product line. And so I'm an Apple guy, right? So I've got my, I'm talking to you on my MacBook. I've got my iPhone, I've got my Apple watch, which is charging. I've got my AirPods. I've committed. And the more that I use all the products, the better the experience gets, right? With the Lordship view, it everybody's always looking at everybody else's life. So the community starts to police and itself and the leaders don't even have to be present. And the more that you can have policing of the other members, the more difficult the environment becomes for self-expression and in a, a conformity and in a group thing kind of sets in. And 
we always think about thoughts as being Americans, we tend to think it very individualistically. So like we hear the word group think and we like recoil instantly, but group think is a neutral term. And I hope that my kids and I develop, you know, a, a level of group think around the family, what we view as a shared view of our family between my kids and I, there's really good reasons to have a shared narrative and a shared point of view. It's a very bonding experience. The problem is when that, when you're bound to something and you don't even understand that you're bound to it, and then they start upping the ante, they start taking you away from your authentic self into these other, into these other places, shaping your point of view. And so the free grace movement versus the Lordship that created a lot of things. Then the the next aspect in this guy's business model was starting a seminary. And so this is the the franchising of his brand. And and what happened is as the seminary students graduated, they started targeting churches for placement that were existing, but needed new pastors. And then when they would get in there, they would have these very uh, black and white views on a lot of topics where where the existing church didn't quite agree with those topics, but they found more alignment with these people than they found with other schools that had traditionally produced the candidates. Oh, okay. and, and so what, what you started to see was the pastors from this one church would go in and they would start to they get on the elder board, they'd start to appoint other people and, and people who followed this group would start coming to the church. A lot of them listen to the the primary speaker on the radio and they would Mm -hmm. look for graduates of his seminary in their town. And then they would, in essence, do a hostile takeover. You find an underperforming asset where the people don't understand that you're coming in to change it. And it's like buying distressed real estate. And so in essence, he, they have brought, bought up all this real estate. Then people respond to fraud. That's one of the things people at first will be fooled by fraud. And so churches started to see this pattern in in these pastors that they would come in and they would take over the church. And eventually they would have only this brand of theology on their elder board. And the people who started the church didn't feel at home in their own churches and Mm -hmm. would either suffer or leave. Mm -hmm. And so churches stopped accepting these. And so then all of a sudden the leader gets the vision that they need to start new churches. And because that distribution channel had been shut down and the cycle continues. And then And this guy's son is uh, a businessman, and there's nothing wrong with that, being one myself. But he would always brag about how Christian of a businessman he was. And now he come to find out he's under investigation by the SEC for fraudulent schemes. And so at this point, this becomes an attack from Satan on he can't get to me, so he's going after my son and all this kind of stuff. And so the narrative of how an issue is talked about internally is very powerful. And so they tend to circle the wagons and be the only ones with the authority to speak on an issue. They do uh, a very classic like message control thing, which is we're the only ones with all the facts and you have to trust us and know that we're godly men and we're trust us. If you had all the facts, you'd make the same decision as us. Oh, interesting. I've connected with a number of of victims of sexual abuse from this church, this school, and have spoken at length with their stories, seen the police reports, and then just seen the statements put out by these places. And they're just 180 degrees out of whack. Mm -hmm. And if you try to get anybody that goes there to look at them, they tell you it's, it's a tainted source and all this kind of stuff. And you may think that you have sway in friends, but when you never really know what your friendships are until you cross the leader. And they have a very large array of tactics to cut you off. And, and that's, why they, that's why they call it excommunication, because you're no mm-hmm. longer in communion. And, and I was never offered a reconciliation, anything. I, it was just a letter that you've been, we request that you don't come back. You've been formally voted out by the congregation and you've been excommunicated. And I love the church that I went to dearly. I would go every week. And that's my perspective on everything. I'm sure they have theirs and, and that kind of stuff. But those are a lot of the trends that I see the use of very divisive language to create market differentiation. You then fall into a theological line, which is like your brand. And it helps you to make the denominations help you make 
a proxy decision, right? Apple as a brand stands for this. Presbyterianism stands for this. Evangelical Baptist stands for this. There was a really good book on the independent fundamentalist Baptist uh, churches, which I was never part of. But And really what they explain is independent fundamentalist Baptist churches mostly got going out of Bob Jones University. This was another way that they used the principle of division to create a brand. And Uh so they had what they called uh, third degree separation. And so they take the passage in the Bible that says you're supposed to be called out from the world to be salt and light. And they say, so if you live in the world, you're not a Christian. Then you say, if you have friends that live in the world, that is compromising you. So they quarantine you off from those friends. And then if you have, that's the second degree of separation. First degree is you yourself are separate. Second degree is you don't have any friends that are separate. And the third degree is if you have a friend who has friends that are part of the world, then you Mm -hmm. have to separate Mm -hmm. from them. And so Mm -hmm. it it's the ultimate like tribalization of a group. And then what happens is these churches, the leaders gain too much power and they become gatekeepers. And when you have a gatekeeper model, you have the fertile ground for abuse. This is, I would say, a principle that is beyond religion. I always like to say, what does Hollywood and the church have most in common? It's that they love to cover up sexual abuse when it's theirs, and they love to cry foul when the other one is committing sexual abuse. And so there was a movement in Hollywood, which was a needed reckoning for the use of the casting couch. And the blowback that these poor women suffered for speaking up against the sexual abuse is really painful. But it was enabled by the fact that these powerful Hollywood executives were the gatekeeper to becoming a successful star. And if you apply the same model to church, these are the people that are supposed to watch over your soul and they are the gatekeeper to God. That gatekeeper, that being the path and the the mechanism to something that you desire becomes the power that allows abuse to be perpetrated and carried forth. And it also creates the cover for for people to continue to get away with it because they cut you out if you get too strong, if you have too much independence, if you speak up to it. And then if it does actually bubble out that somebody's been misbehaving, Mm -hmm. it's talked about in very delicate and abstract terms. Whereas I think one of the things that finally broke me was people would rail against you know, this sin or that sin and talk about how they would take a bold stand against it. But as soon as the sin came in the church, they became quiet as church mice and they mm-hmm. wanted to talk in euphemistic terms. And I think that part of it is with somebody and you love them, it's so much harder. It's easy to condemn sin in general, but when you know a person, yeah. it's so hard to like make it personal. And I think just to jump in, because there's so some- there's so much to respond to, and I know that there's so, so much more for you to say. But I did want to say that, yes, I think the the women and the men who have come forward to talk about abuse within religious systems, abuse within movie industry and other industries, even comedy. There are just so many industries, theater, where there is that kind of rampant abuse that unless you do this, then you won't get all that you've worked for. Or you will never, it usually is in that very definitive kind of language, you will never have a relationship with God. You will never get to heaven. You will never have a career. You will never be able to support your family or whatever it is. I think that there is something that a lot of people have felt really ashamed about when they think about that. They went along with it. And I think what people, I hope, who are listening are sometimes not giving themselves credit for is that they were dealing with a situation that they believed at the time was their only option. And there wasn't another way out. There also, usually in those systems, there isn't somebody to talk to say, hey, I was just offered this and I was just told to do this. And if I don't do that, I'm not going to go to heaven or I'm not going to ever have a stage career. Is that actually true? And because there isn't the openness to have that conversation, you're on your own. 
And you have to really deal with this on your own and make a decision on the spot that I think feels less scary. And the threats hanging over your head, I think, are the things that feel more scary than the actions themselves at, at certain times. And so I think that the, the fact that people feel powerless and that they feel voiceless and also alone helps to embolden so many of the people in positions of authority who then know that they can get away with it. And you were also talking about the language used, the language of fraud. And how was that used? What were the phrases that you remember either being told to you or hearing about that were fraudulent, but seemed, you know, really valid at the time? I would say the most common pattern is the conversion of nuance into black and white thinking. So in computer and in programming, as I've been a programmer, this is what we call variable declaration. Mm -hmm. And you say, I'm going to hold, this variable will hold the number, it'll hold a string of text, uh, or it'll hold various types of data. This is going to hold integers, which are only whole numbers. This is going to hold decimal point numbers. This is going to hold a string. These are some of the more dynamic languages will automatically take whatever you put and cast it into one of those. But very strictly typed languages, if you give a string when a number is expected, it will break the program and you'll get the like the Windows blue screens of death and all that kind of stuff. That's what they call a buffer overflow. What you'll find is that in these groups, they're going to be typecasting the world for you. So you're either for God, you're against God. You're, you're either living in truth or you're living in falsehood. And so there's a lot of assumptions that go into the casting of this topic as black and white. They'll throw, their program will throw an error if you don't return true or false. I would say that healthy communities allow for discourse and discussion. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. everything relative, but there is a lot more nuance to life. Mm -hmm. And that's really very difficult to break free of is having overly strict constructs on life. And when you leave, not that you have to, but when you process and you deal with things that don't align with who you are, guilt does sweep in. Everybody that has been conned by Bernie Madoff felt guilty. And it was a deep guilt because it preyed upon the community. There's a really great book called How to Smell a Rat by Ken Fisher that he wrote in the uh, wake of the Bernie Madoff scandal. And he was a money manager and he wanted to tell people how to deal. How, the, if you do these five things, you'll prevent yourself from being financially scammed. Mm -hmm. And one of them was who holds the money? Is he allowed to, is he allowed to take money out of your account or he can do trades on your behalf, but can he take the money out? If he can take uh -huh. the money out, he can rob you blind. And that, that was a problem mm -hmm. Bernie made off is mm -hmm. he had both the power to invest and the power to take money out. Normally, uh, professional money managers only have the power to invest. So you put mm -hmm. the money in the account mm -hmm. and there's a third party over here that they control the in and the out and you're the only person that can take the money in and out. Now, once it's in the account, they can buy all the stock they want with it. And so the question is, in your thought life, is this other voice allowed to be the one that both sets true and false and then gets to evaluate those rules in your thing, right? Are they able to take money out and put money in and do the trading? And I know that's, that's a little abstract, so I'm looking for a good illustration, but it would be if somebody tells you this is a principle and you apply the principle and you arrive at a different conclusion than they do, like we should stand up to sex abuse no matter where it is. That's a principle. And then you start saying, we've got some problems around here. And yeah, they're not Hollywood level, but they're problems. And right, they start right. saying, no, we're talking about like, that. that's not a real problem and he's working on it. And you just need to have forgiveness. That's the money spending. The arbitrary use of who is forgiven and not forgiven, when grace is doled out and when it's not, when the leader has that power, they have the power to do the stock trades and take the money out of the account. And that because they are the dispensers of grace in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And grace, forgiveness, like they get to define these, process, these processes. You lose your autonomy over that. The elders decide. They become an arbiter of the social and you get stuck. Yeah. And, and it makes you wonder also who gets to be in that role and why. So often it's nepotistic. And so people are just given that from 
father to son or whoever else in that they somehow have this sort of ability to say, I get to decide. I get to decide everything for you for now and forever. I think it's incrementally built. One of the things when you study the people that steal a lot of money, like Bernie Madoff, he didn't steal all the money in one year. He wrote, he fudged the numbers one year and nobody caught it. And this is one of those other like crazy tactics, which is he, Bernie Madoff was on the ethics committee for the SEC and he was literally the biggest violator. And Larry Nasser, the man who abused thousands of girls as the head U.S. gymnast coach, Nasser wrote the training manual that became the standard for how to treat girls and tried to shuttle his pedophilia in through becoming the standard. Like he tried to standardize on pedophilia and he would do horrible things to these children. And so I hope people hear in those illustrations that I don't have an ax to grind with the church. I just want people to be safe out there. And fraud is a human problem. And so as humans, if we engage in any activity, there will be fraud. And, and fraudsters are people that are, are claiming that they're going to give you value. And in reality, they're taking from you. That's the fraud. A lot of people are unwilling to accept fraud because of the implications it means for their own life. There were so many people that were unwilling to accept that Bernie Madoff was making off with all the money because it would mean that they had told so many other people to join this and it was such a sound investment. And on top of that, they weren't being risky. This guy was a sure thing. This is a sure thing. Like when you think we've got a corner on truth and surety and there's no risk of this, there's no risk of that, like that is one to believism. I want to believe it. And whether that's because you you are naive, and I mean that in the least judgmental way, just right. as a starting point in your journey, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. or you're you're too busy. You you get busy and you don't notice the fraud. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm building anti-fraud technology. And uh and so much fraud is lost because people just don't even check their statements. And there, there's all this, like you start trying to shut down fraud and people are like, look, we don't want to shut down the fraud because we make a lot of money selling anti-fraud software. We make a lot of money doing mm-hmm. these things. So mm-hmm. when you threaten somebody else's business model, know that mm-hmm. they, will, they will retaliate. Yeah. Fraud is such a betrayal and betrayal is a very difficult emotion for people. Mm-hmm. And they will do like the want to believeism, which I love that phrase. And the one to believeism also wants us to delay the the obvious, the fact that you're being betrayed, the fact that this person is swindling you or potentially swindling you or that you've made a bad decision or this isn't going to be the panacea that you thought and that you wanted. And I agree with you. It's not a naive thing in a negative way. I think when people are trustworthy in their own lives, we assume that what's true for us is true for other people. And that just means you're a trustworthy person until you've been burned. And then you develop, hopefully, a sense of what to watch out for. It doesn't change you necessarily to have you become like them, but then you get a sense of the warning signs or at least the feeling that feels familiar. But yes, I think people who trust other people are coming from a trusting place. And so I I think that's actually sort of a compliment when you call people naive in these ways. And I think even in small ways that we've all dealt with, I had a friend who years ago told me that he got a summer job selling used cars and he was, it was in Seattle and they did very well because, I don't know if this is always the case, but he said that you can sell more used cars that have dings and scrapes when it's raining because it hides a lot of the things that you would notice if the car were dry. And so in those little moments, you learn how you're being played. And it's very hard. It's very hard when these moments start to mount up. But especially with people, because this is we're talking about a used car salesman, which is fine, and there's some who are fine. But when you're talking about family, and when you're talking about your pastor, and when you're talking about your boss who is giving you an opportunity of a lifetime, then it makes it happen on such a grand scale that I think people delay the feeling of devastation. One song that really meant a lot to me was a song called Nice, Naive, and Beautiful by the artist Plum. 
And it ends with the line, get out of that place that's restraining your love. And ultimately, that song, which is a Christian artist, is was very instrumental in helping me to see my path out of the, the toxic culture that was that church. And that's what I would say to people is, is there's a lot of art around processing your trauma and have a lot of compassion for yourself if you find yourself the victim of fraud. And then just know that there's nothing wrong with you. These people specialize in finding victims. And if it wasn't you, it would have been somebody else. And, and they're going to keep adapting their patterns to until they find enough people. And so they're relentless in that way. But yeah, so Nice, Naive, and Beautiful is a beautiful song about the journey out of uh, a toxic starting point to, to a new place. And, and yeah, that, has, that song has meant a lot to me. Thank you, Daniel. We will talk again soon. One more thing before you go. I am grateful to Daniel for starting to talk with me today so that all of you could hear a little bit about what it's like to grow up in a very strict environment where your thinking is shaped and then to have other experiences, other religious experiences that leave you feeling betrayed and pushed away and judged. And to be able to also then understand things from a business perspective, from the idea of cultic groups being like fraudulent businesses. Sometimes people need some terminology to help them understand what happened to them. And it's actually not so esoteric at times. Sometimes it can be brought to a particular model through which we can understand things. And I find that very, very helpful. I think what's also important is to be able to understand how there can be fraud in business and there can be spiritual fraud. It is all about selling a product that isn't real or isn't healthy or is actually never going to be the product that you sell, but you're going to sell them something else along the way or instead. Either way, there's deception. And either way, there's a lack of fundamental respect for the person you're dealing with. Because they do feel like they can take advantage. Some of these leaders do feel entitled to swindle and to take advantage of people's trust, whether it be financial or spiritual. What we do when we look at things in a different way is we have other ways to explain it to other people. When sometimes people will say to us, well, help me understand how you got sucked into something or help me understand why you stayed for so long or why what happened there hurt you so much. And if you have, again, language that's not necessarily so based in psychology, but more in kind of the language of everyday life, then it becomes a lot easier for people to understand and to explain. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a person named Robert Cialdini. And I have spoken about him a bit before on this podcast. He had spoken at some conferences having to do with cults. He is someone who studies this from a sociological perspective and also from a business model. He talks a lot about influence and the techniques of influence. And some of the ones that we've talked about in the past are things like reciprocity. If you feel someone's giving you something you can't get anywhere else or that is special beyond anything you've been given before then you feel the need to give back or sacrifice more. And also the idea of scarcity, that you can only buy this here or you can only get this from this person and you can only get the answers from this wise teacher or from this pastor. So as we move through studying about Robert Cialdini a bit, I also want to make sure to mention that 
he has a subsequent book to his book on influence, and it's called Persuasion. And I think it's worth checking out because when we talk about persuasion, we're talking about grooming. And I talk about grooming on other podcast episodes where people were really groomed to be okay with being mistreated or somehow to be quiet and stay quiet when people were crossing their boundaries or groomed to just be patient and not question when the things they were promised seemed to still never be coming their way. And so this persuasion or what I refer to as grooming happens so often within these kinds of groups that Daniel was talking about and that we talk about here on the show. There are some ideas that I wanted to be able to highlight that at first, what you have with persuasion is you have the need to establish trust. And sometimes we just assume that people are trustworthy because of the positions that they hold, because they are the pastor or because they are the teacher. And I think people need to actually prove to you that they're trustworthy and it's not enough for them to just hold that title or hold that position to be trustworthy. It also, at times, in a very visual way, helps people feel sudden trust when someone is dressed very sharply or dressed all in white or in robes that seem very spiritual, but the person underneath the robe might not be any kind of spiritual being in the least bit. And so they still need to prove to you that they are trustworthy. But I know that there are a lot of people who will be swayed by visuals. I know that when people walk into a waiting area of a doctor's office or an attorney's office or whatever kind of office, and it's really nice, and they're offered possibly some tea or coffee, they have this sense that the person they're going to be meeting with is really going to be able to help them, even though they have no idea about that and they haven't even met the person yet. And so we are swayed by the visuals. What is important also to remember is how often that's used in our daily life. Something else that Robert Cialdini talks about is when things are seemingly insignificant, they are actually not. And I think about in advertisements for things where you see commercials for medications where they're running through all the lists of possible side effects, some of the really horrible side effects that can come with taking that medication. But the visuals are happy people running and horseback riding and looking really healthy and doing wonderful things together and living long lives. And the words don't match the visuals, but we notice the visuals. And also when things seem kind of family oriented, well, they're going to have families together, or let's say going back to this idea of a pastor, the pastor will be there with their spouse and with their children to be able to convey that message that this is a family friendly place. But still, you don't know until you know, until you investigate that for yourself. I think also about the movie Get Out. I don't know if you saw this movie, um, kind of a psychological thriller. I noticed in one particular scene, going back to this idea of visuals and this idea that things might seem seemingly insignificant, that there is the scene of an outdoor garden party. And as I was watching the scene, I was noticing that everyone is wearing black and white which is certainly about the racial divide and the message of the movie. But every once in a while, I noticed that some of the people in the movie, along with wearing black and white, were also wearing hints of red. Could have been red socks or a little red scarf. And you could tell those were the people who were going to be doing some sort of evil. And... I noticed it the first time a bit, and then I watched the movie again, and I noticed it very clearly. But those kinds of things send messages in kind of a um, subconscious way, in a way where we might not pick up on it. And sometimes we don't pick up on it right away, but we pick up on having a feeling about a particular person, either good or bad. We might not know why that is, but it's important to think about how the environment or the way they look, or the way they're dressed, 
or the way they're presented to us by people who seem trustworthy, how all of that can make us lower our defenses. It also is important to be able to understand that there is so much that some people do and some places do to, again, make people feel open to the promises and make people feel like it's a wonderful idea to be in your company or to be receiving something from you. And this all happens before any actual fact is presented, before the message of what they're going to be selling you is even presented. So be mindful of how you're being worked on from the beginning. I think I want to finish up by saying something also about how important it is to look at this sort of other piece of persuasion, which is this idea of a competitor crusher. Cults use this a lot. Cults have an attitude about people who are outside of the group, about people who could be pulling you away from that kind of control. And so you want to watch out for this. You want to watch out for the person who says, not only what we can provide for you here and how wonderful it is, but mm, how we want you to feel in a negative way about the people outside, basically the competition, the people who could pull you away, the people who could convince you this isn't a good thing for you. And that whenever anyone tells you that not only is this wonderful here, but it's so bad out there. And everyone that's a part of that is so bad and is going to pull you away from this wonderfulness. You really have to step back and step away and wonder why they're trying so hard to defame everyone else. And it's usually because they see the other people as competition. When you're in a healthy relationship, think of it as a rubber band. A rubber band that can be pulled around and stretched around not only the person you're in contact with and the person who you might be following or the person who you think you're learning from, but it can make room for the other people in your life, for your family, for your friends, for your partners. Because within a healthy relationship, those people are not threats, they're not seen as the competition. So if someone tells you you can only have room for them in your life and their ideas in your life, that's a time to step away. And that's a time to see that they're not able to kind of pull the rubber band around that group of people. But instead, they're just going to keep you tied to them and wrap it around just the two of you in terms of control. I'm giving you that also as a visual because visuals matter so much. And I want you, as you know, to be safe out there. Talk to you next week. Thanks again for listening. Tired of ads? Well, listen or download this show for free on NPR's radio public app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. Please support Indoctrination at patreon.com slash indoctrination. We have over 100 interviews that you can access with any donation. Subscribers receive bonus interviews and other cool goodies. And we love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. Thank you for your support.